we like to say that weapons were once manufactured for wars, and wars are now manufactured for weapons sales. With many complexities and exceptions, this is basically true. But so is this. Wars were once justified with religions, and now war is a religion. For centuries, the leading propaganda in Western wars or genocides was the need to bring the proper religion to the enemy, or the privilege to disregard or mass murder the enemy for lacking the proper religion. The line between killing people because they don't matter and going to great trouble to help people, whether they like it or not, because they do matter, was blurred by the tool employed, namely war and the nonsensical sophistry of just war theory, in which you can not only respect someone by killing him, but actually be doing him a favor while doing yourself a favor by risking getting killed. Of course, conquered people who survived were converted to some form of the desired religion, usually one shaped in part by them, and always one that supported war, and always one that treated belief as something that could be commanded. There's a story of an indigenous war victim asking whether heaven would have Christians in it and upon being told yes, remarking that he would prefer not to go there. The notion that war is philanthropic has almost always depended overwhelmingly on the testimony of invaders, not invaded. To some extent, nationalism took on a similar role to religion. The day after the United States declared war on Spain in 1898, the first state, New York, passed a law requiring that school children salute the U.S. flag. Flag Day was created by President Woodrow Wilson on the birthday of the U.S. Army during the propaganda campaign for World War I. To my knowledge, in only two countries do children regularly recite a pledge to a flag. The original stiff arm salute they made in the United States was changed to a hand on the heart after a straight arm became associated with Nazism. Nowadays visitors from abroad are often shocked to see US children instructed to stand and robotically chant an oath of obedience to a piece of colored cloth. US families who lose a loved one in war are presented with a flag instead. A majority of Americans supports criminalizing the burning of a U.S. flag. The U.S. flag appears on Catholic altars in some states as well as in other churches and sacred arenas. Wars are mostly no longer thought of as expanding national borders in any explicit way, but they are marketed as spreading democracy, upholding a rules-based order, policing the globe, and bringing freedom to whoever crawls out of the rubble. This, too, depends mostly on the testimony of the invaders. In various international polls, people in numerous countries have ranked the U.S. government first when asked to name the greatest threat to peace in the world. Polls in the U.S. have found a public believing that Iraqis or Afghans or Libyans were either grateful for being attacked or irrational for being ungrateful. And of course, the United States is no more a model of democracy than war makers of the past had virtue to justify their atrocities. The United States has plenty of good points, but is the leading incarcerator, leading environmental destroyer, leading weapons dealer, leading war maker, leading opponent of international law, leading holdout on basic human rights and disarmament treaties, while trailing most wealthy nations and some poor ones, in life expectancy, health, education, political participation, civil liberties, and happiness. More so than patriotism filling the role of religion when it comes to war, I think what we have seen is the development of war into a religion of itself. Yes, actual motivations for wars include weapon sales and politics and insane lust for power and sadism, as well as the media ratings and careerism of systems structured to promote and admit no alternatives to war. But the propaganda is a combination of hatred of the enemy, humanitarianism, and war for the sake of war. 
within about a year and a half of the beginning of the wars on Afghanistan and Iraq, and from those days to this, you've had solid majorities in the United States saying those wars never should have been begun. Yet it was a longer struggle to get a majority to favor ending those wars. The thinking, if you can call it that, was that these one-sided slaughters without redeeming purpose needed to be continued for the sake of the U.S. troops waging them, even if those troops told pollsters that they wanted the wars ended. To stop sacrificing bodies to the god of war is to concede that all the bodies thus far sacrificed have been to no god at all. Once you get into the question of a particular war, concern for consequences fly out the window. You must invade and occupy another country or the terrorists win, even if you know perfectly well that your action will increase terrorism. Russia must invade Ukraine or NATO will win, even if Russia knows perfectly well that its action will be the biggest boost to NATO in decades. NATO must go on expanding or Russia will win, even if NATO knows perfectly well that it is increasing the risk of nuclear apocalypse. Russia must threaten the new NATO members, even if Russia knows perfectly well that doing so will boost weapon sales to those countries further yet. This disregard for consequences is part of an array of characteristics that war has in common with religious beliefs and traditional or Kantian ideas of morality. Another is the mythical nature of the cause. From my use of the word Russian, you can already detect that I'm not a true believer in war. Were I, I would use only the word Putin. When you believe in a war, the bombing of thousands of men, women, and children is understood to be a fight against a single individual of monstrous proportions. And, back to that lack of consequences, this is regardless of whether your actions will actually strengthen that individual's hold on power and worsen that individual's behavior. Another characteristic that war shares with religion is Manichaeanism or dualism a belief in the absolute goodness of one side and evil of the other. Enough time has gone by that you can suggest to an average person that both participants in some long ago duel with pistols at 20 paces were engaged in a stupid and barbarous ritual. But you have to be careful saying the same about both sides of a current war. In fact, noting the slightest flaw in one side of a war will typically get you accused of being in the pay of the other side. Mentioning the slightest virtue in anyone on one side of a war will most certainly get you accused of cheerleading for that side's war making. The reason that George W. Bush said, you are with us or you are against us, is that people already loved to think such damaging nonsense, and they still do. But the reason that George W. Bush and Rudy Giuliani went from being unpopular buffoons to being adored heroes simply by being president and mayor on September 11, 2001, was the childish longing for obedience and servility that religion shares with war. It's these habits of thought and emotion that most characterize war as a religion. The thrill that people feel when they see a flag or thank a veteran or watch a distant explosion on television is a modern religion. And one way you can tell that is the swiftness and certainty with which it shuts down thinking. In various studies, when you show someone evidence that war propaganda is false, they come away believing it more strongly rather than less. They've identified with it and believe that professing their allegiance to it is a matter of personal preference, independent of any facts, exactly as freedom of religion tells them it is. And facts that don't fit don't exist. Your side has no flaws. The other side has no merits. Wars don't happen in people's villages, but on an imaginary battlefield. Wars are not one-sided slaughters, but sportsmanlike contests. Holding a memorial day for the 4% of deaths in recent U.S. wars that were U.S. lives is perfectly appropriate. 
it would be nonsensical to put Vietnamese names on the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., since the memorial would then stretch all the way to the Capitol and back to the Potomac and back and forth various times. In fact, it would be nonsensical to become aware of that fact. U.S. polls show that virtually nobody has any idea that the majority of federal discretionary spending goes to the single item of the military. It's preferred not to know certain things. You can love wars and hate taxes, even as over half of your taxes fund wars. Mass shooters in the United States are disproportionately veterans trained to shoot by the U.S. military, but it would be improper to know that. It might create a prejudice against veterans or worse, a desire to stop creating more veterans. Even when you learn facts that contradict your religion and accept those facts, it can have no impact. According to a recent book by Andrew Basevich, who's uh, those U.S. military members who have died in the wars of recent decades, quote, died in service to their country. Of that, there is no doubt. Whether they died to advance the cause of freedom or even the well-being of the United States is another matter entirely. End quote. Basevich goes on to suggest that the wars have been fought for, quote, oil, dominion, hubris, end quote, and other unflattering things. So why am I not permitted to doubt that this has been a service to a country? In fact, how can I avoid doubting that wasting trillions of dollars that could have positively transformed billions of lives to engage in killing and injuring and making homeless and traumatizing millions of people, doing immense damage to the natural environment and political stability and the rule of law and civil liberties and U.S. and global culture, how can I possibly refrain from doubting that this is any service at all? Well, easy. I can make calling war a service mandatory. I can even dictate that branches of the military will simply be called the services and create armed services committees to facilitate them in Congress. Of course, the peace movement would be devastated if it lost the people who work for peace and are religious and who say that they work for peace because they are religious. But I have no concern at all with beliefs that don't devalue human life or human responsibility for human fate or promote blind obedience or facilitate the development of an identity that devalues those outside of it. Unfortunately, I see both traditional religion and war as doing more of those things than of anything worthwhile. If Barbara Ehrenreich has it right in her book, Blood Rights, Origins, and History of the Passions of War, the earliest precursors to wars were battles against lions, leopards, and other ferocious predators of people. In fact, those predatory beasts may be the base material from which gods were invented, and unmanned drones named, for example, the predator, the, quote, ultimate sacrifice in war may be intimately connected with the practice of human sacrifice as it existed before wars as we know them came to be. The emotions, not the creeds or accomplishments, but some of the sensations of religion and war may be so similar, if not identical, because the two practices have a common history and have never been far apart. Europeans in North America fought religious wars for many generations prior to the War for Independence from England. Captain John Underhill in 1637 described his own heroic war making against the Pequot. Quote, Captain Mason entered into a wigwam, brought out a firebrand. After he had wounded many in the house, then he set fire to the west side. Myself set fire on the south end with a train of powder, the fires of both meeting in the center of the fort blazed most terribly and burnt all in the space of half an hour. Many courageous fellows were unwilling to come out and fought most desperately. So as they were scorched and burnt, and so perished valiantly, many were burnt in the fort, both men, women, and children. This Underhill explains as a holy war, quote, 
The Lord is pleased to exercise his people with trouble and afflictions that he might appear to them in mercy and reveal more clearly his free grace unto their souls. End quote. Underhill means his own soul, and the Lord's people are, of course, the white folks. The Native Americans may have been courageous and valiant, but they were not people. If war evolved as a way for the men who killed giant beasts to keep busy killing other men as those animals died out, as Ehrenreich theorizes, its partnership with racism and all other distinctions between groups of people is a long one. On March 31st, at the New York Times, David Brooks, who is paid more per line than you'll probably see all year, proclaimed the dire need for a restoration of patriotism. Quote, because you're online so much, you probably saw the Wall Street Journal NORC poll that came out this week. It found that the share of Americans who say patriotism is very important to them has dropped to 38% from 70% since 1998. The share who say religion is very important has dropped to 39% from 62%. The share who say community involvement is very important has dropped to 27% from 47%. The share who say having children is very important has dropped to 30% from 59%. Blah, blah, Reagan, blah, Clinton, blah, blah, blah. My greatest fear is that the latest renewal will be killed in its crib by the intractable forces of cynicism and withdrawal. Blah, blah, end quote. Brooks makes a mishmash of patriotism, trust, community, and all sorts of stuff. But patriotism actually has a meaning. It means giving importance and affection to a nation. To any extent that people can identify with the world and with their local communities, over and above the disastrous institution of the nation, so much the better. That only 38% of people in the United States say patriotism is very important is highly encouraging. National governments, and especially this one, are the primary threat to peace, environmental survival, and actual self-governance. A peace movement, by the way, that thinks it has to wrap peace in national flags in order to not make the absence of mass murder offensive to people because of something that happened during the destruction of Vietnam should pay attention to actual public polling. Of course, one can read a great deal into simple numbers, I don't know what each person thinks in detail when they think patriotism is not very important. Maybe they passionately believe that if they could consistently get lied to and screwed over by respectable Democrats instead of Trumpish buffoons, then patriotism would be glorious. Maybe they only dislike patriotism because they're generally misanthropic, ignorant, and simply lacking in the acquired wisdom of David Brooks not having been around long enough to be publicly wrong about so many things for so many years. But it seems more likely to me that they've noticed that corrupt and cynical jackasses believe they'll fall for getting scammed if enough flags are waved, that patriotism is principally a war marketing racket, and that the first refuge of a scoundrel remains patriotism. Brooks thinks they need to stop distrusting institutions and that doing so will revive patriotism. I think institutions need to start earning their trust and that they'll be better able to do so without toxic propaganda like patriotism. On a more rapid downward course is something else that Brooks didn't mention, military recruitment which has fallen off so dramatically that Congress members are lobbying the president not to forgive any student debt for fear doing so will impede recruitment further. Maybe a new slogan should be, kill and die to live in the country where you can't get educated unless you kill and die. Religion has dropped in the U.S. to 39% saying it's very important. As with patriotism, the U.S. is slowly moving in the direction of many other countries, including European countries that have long had more sense of community, more trust in institutions, 
and much less patriotism and religion. People becoming wise enough to realize a flag doesn't fix their problems or those of the planet ought darn well to be wise enough to realize that magical make-believe doesn't help. This may actually be part of a story of greater community and trust. Many people between 1998 and now have dropped various forms of bigotry. When that comes to include bigotry toward people from different religious backgrounds, then one is faced with believing that numerous contradictory fairy tales are somehow all true or that none are. Of course, not going to church and not crying during the paid-for patriotism prior to sporting events can diminish a sense of community. But the same can be rebuilt more solidly outside of the instruments of division and infantile thought habits. Of course, many religious teachings are of basic morality, but the same can be taught by anyone. The fact that community can be built outside of decrepit relics of colonialism and ignorance doesn't mean it has been. Sadly, those who say community involvement is very important has dropped to 27%. This does not, of course, tell us whether anyone is kind, generous, loving, honest, intelligent, courageous, or anything else. It does tell us that something valuable is being lost. It does not tell us how to change that. One way to change it would be with honesty and kindness, would be telling people that we are in fact facing global crises and need to build global and local communities to address those crises. That we are confronted by rotten governments and oligarchs and need to take them on with the effective tools of nonviolent action, local government, cross-border solidarity, and the ability to see through David Brooks's bullshit without in any way becoming the pathetic suicidal wrecks he might imagine that would require us to be. Brooks laments a lack of importance on having children without mentioning that people know the earth is facing an ever-growing likelihood of environmental collapse and or nuclear apocalypse, and without mentioning that it costs money to raise children, something fewer and fewer people have. This sort of tone deafness is, at least for many people, what drives the cynicism and withdrawal that Brooks fears. But it doesn't have to. We can confront the cynicism of elected and unelected engineers of the current disaster train rather than becoming like them. The New York Times routinely tells bigger lies than the clumsy nonsense it published about weapons in Iraq. An example is a recent column called Liberals have a blind spot on defense, which mentions nothing related to defense. It simply pretends that militarism is defensive by applying that word and by lying that, quote, we face simultaneous and growing military threats from Russia and China, end quote. Seriously? Where? The U.S. military budget is more than those of most nations of the world combined. Only 29 nations out of some 200 on Earth spend even 1% what the U.S. does. Of those 29, a full 26 are U.S. weapons customers. Many of those receive free U.S. weapons and or training and or have U.S. bases in their countries. Only one non-ally, non-weapons customer, albeit a collaborator in bioweapons research labs, spends over 10% what the U.S. does namely China, which was at 37% of U.S. spending in 2021 and likely about the same now, despite the highly horrifying increases widely reported in the U.S. media and on the floor of Congress. And that's not considering weapons for Ukraine and various other U.S. expenses. While the U.S. has planted military bases around Russia and China, Neither has a military base anywhere near the United States, and neither has threatened the United States. Now, if you don't want to fill the globe with U.S. weaponry and provoke Russia and China on their borders, the New York Times has some additional lies for you. Quote, defense spending is about as pure an application of a domestic industrial policy with thousands of good paying, high skilled manufacturing jobs as any other high tech sector. No, it's not. 
just about any other way of spending public dollars or even not taxing them in the first place produces more and better jobs as we see in reports from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Now here's a doozy from the New York Times quote liberals also used to be hostile to the military on the assumption that it skewed right wing but that's a harder argument to make when the right is complaining about a woke military end quote. What in the world would it mean to oppose organized mass murder because it skews right wing? What the hell else could it skew? I oppose militarism because it kills, destroys, damages the earth, drives homelessness and illness and poverty, prevents global cooperation, tears down the rule of law, prevents self-governance, produces the dumbest pages of the New York Times, fuels bigotry, and militarizes police, and because there are better ways to resolve disputes and to resist the militarism of others. I'm not going to start cheering for mass killing because some general doesn't hate enough groups. And then there's this lie, quote, the Biden administration touts the size of its $842 billion budget request, and in nominal terms, it's the largest ever, but that fails to, in to account for inflation, end quote. But if you look at U.S. military spending, according to CIPRI, in constant 2021 dollars from 1949 to now all the years they provide with their calculation adjusting for inflation Obama's 2011 record will probably fall this year if you look at actual numbers not adjusting for inflation Biden has set a new record each year if you add in the free weapons for Ukraine then even adjusting for inflation the record fell this past year and will probably be broken again in the coming year. You will hear all sorts of different numbers depending on what's included. Most used is probably $886 billion for what President Biden has proposed, which includes the military, the nuclear weapons, and some of so-called homeland security. In the absence of massive public pressure on a topic the public hardly knows exists, we can count on an increase by Congress, plus major new piles of free weapons to Ukraine. For the first time, U.S. military spending, not counting various secret spending and veterans spending, etc., will likely top $950 billion. War profiteer funded stink tankers like to view military spending as a philanthropic project to be measured as a percentage of an economy or GDP. As if the more money a country has, the more it should spend on organized killing. There are two more sensible ways to look at it. Both can be seen at worldbeyondwar.org in our mapping militarism project. One is as simple amounts per nation. In these terms, the U.S. is at a historic high and soaring far, far over the rest of the world. The other way to look at it is per capita. As with a comparison of absolute spending, one has to travel far down the list to find any of the designated enemies of the U.S. government. But here Russia jumps to the top of that list, spending a full 20% of what the U.S. does per person while only spending less than 9% in total dollars. In contrast, China slides down the list spending less than 9% per person, what the United States does, while spending 37% in absolute dollars. Iran, meanwhile, spends 5% per capita, what the U.S. does, compared to just over 1% in total spending. Our New York Times friend writes that the U.S. needs to spend more to dominate four oceans, while China need worry only about one. But here, the U.S. desire to treat economic competition as a form of war blinds the commentator to the fact that a lack of war facilitates economic success. As Jimmy Carter told Donald Trump, quote, since 1979, do you know how many times China has been at war with anybody? None, and we have stayed at war. 
China has not wasted a single penny on war, and that's why they're ahead of us in almost every way." End quote. But you could drop the idiotic economic competition and still understand the benefits of investing in something other than death, since tiny fractions of military spending could transform the United States and the rest of the world. Surely there would remain plenty of other things to lie about.